1978, I came to know Jesus Christ personally. With God as my Heavenly Father, my life was in His all-powerful, loving hands, and I now expected to be protected from all harm. Within months, I attended a women's conference. When I heard that the speaker was a single missionary doctor who had been captured, beaten, and brutally raped while serving God in the Congo, my faith, my worldview was shattered. How could God permit such a thing? Well, then Dr. Helen Rosevere spoke. She told the story of what happened in 1964 during the Simba uprising. It forever changed my understanding of God and His ways. Countless individuals the world over will say the same thing. It is a privilege to welcome from Northern Ireland, Dr. Helen Rosevere. I can't believe that we have this privilege. And I heard you say in the green room this would be your last trip, Dr. Rosevere, to <laughs> yes, Canada. Probably. I hope that's not true. <laughs> Is it all right at this stage to say how old you are? Yes, yes, you're allowed to. <laughs> I'm 85. Just about um, 86. That's right. <laughs> And this is a story, the first time I heard you tell it, I think in 1980, you did not realize that you were getting up in front of thousands of women to share the darkest experience of your life. You thought it would be a little workshop. Yes. <laughs> and yet that was such a launch pad and has changed and continued to, to ripple into millions of lives around the world ever since. Take us back. Who were you in the 1950s, uh, career-wise, uh, spiritually, what were your hopes and dreams uh, as you headed to the Congo? What was the Congo, the Belgian Congo then? Yes, that's right. Well, you know, being brought up in an ordinary middle class, as we would say in England, family. Uh, I'd finished secondary school and it was during, I, I date myself, it was during the World War Two, not one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I began to feel that God, I wasn't even sure there was a God. God seemed pretty, uh, didn't see much point. I mean, he couldn't control the world. Uh, like so many other families, we had family members who'd been in the war service and who never came back. And uh, all the carnage and the brutality and the cruelty of the war, I found, uh, blew my mind. I couldn't see this in relationship to God, not the God I wanted to believe in. So when I went up to university, uh, to study medicine, I decided in a way to drop God out of the story. I didn't quite do that. I hadn't the courage. I felt, in case I'm wrong, <laughs> I better keep a foot in each world. Hedge your bets here. <laughs> so I, 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 I went to service once every Sunday morning early, but apart from that, I didn't re reckon on God in the story. But I was very lonely at university, and without God in one's life, I found it quite frightening. There were no limits set any longer. Uh, and one had been brought up with clear limits, which made sense. Uh, and then uh, Christian Union girls befriended me, and I watched them, and their lives were just so different from other people. They were always consistently kind, thoughtful, loving. They gave up time to help us to find our way around at university, and uh, I began to go to some of their meetings. I was amazed. They talked about God as so they knew him. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to their prayer meetings. That blew my mind. They prayed to a God whom they knew. And little by little, this hunger grew in my heart. And come the first Christmas holiday from university, uh, they organized to get me to a Christian conference. And we heard clear Bible teaching from a great Bible teacher of the last century, Dr. Graham Scroggie. Mm -hmm. And he took us through Genesis and he took us through Romans. And through this, I was forced to, I had to make a decision. I, I mean, there'd been a row at the supper table and I rushed upstairs and uh, I, I was ashamed and I threw myself in my bed in tears and I said, God, if there is a God, please make yourself known to me now. And I looked up through my tears and written on the wall of the dormitory where I was staying, there was a text, it was wartime and the roof had leaked. And the last word of the text had been wiped out and it just said, be still and know that I am. The word God had been wiped out. But I just prayed, God, if there is a God, make yourself known to me now. And he did. And I was kind of overwhelmed, 
God has actually spoken to me. Uh, and then all the teaching we'd had that week of a lovely Lord Jesus and who had died on the cross for my sin, it all made sense. Uh, and I was suddenly, I think all I can say, I was overwhelmed by the thought of the love of God, that God who made me so loved me, he died for me, that I might be forgiven. And it, it just, I say, my, my friends say, I shouldn't say it, it'd be misunderstood, but I say I fell in love with Jesus that night. Oh, I think he's delighted that you fell in love with him. Well, he was just so wonderful to me. And uh, uh, that, that was my, that was my missionary call. I never had another missionary call. I just knew from that minute I wanted to give my life to sharing Jesus with other people, telling that there's nothing worth doing in life except serving and loving the Lord Jesus. Well, and the Congo, uh, 1953, you went to uh, what, what was a rainforest. Yes. And I did not know until I was rereading your story, you helped build the hospital. I mean, I've seen what they do when they bake bricks and, yeah. and, and make them with those primitive machines That's one right. by one in Africa. That's right. <laughs> you, you rolled up your sleeves and did it. I, I worked in with the workman's team. I, I soon discovered that they work much better if you work with them. Uh, if you only tell them what to do, they, they, while you stand there, they'll do it. But once you, it's same as it is in Ireland, it's no different. We're, we're all the same. Uh, but um, so I worked alongside them and yes, we built a hospital and we, we learned. I had to learn that cement and concrete are not the same. I didn't know that before. <laughs> <laughs> and you delivered babies and you helped lepers and you, you just Ran a served hospital. the people yes. there. But you were there in what would become a very tumultuous chapter of history. It continues to be tumultuous in that country, but tell us what happened. Well, we, like a lot of African countries, in the early 60s, uh, Congo got its independence. It was a colony from Belgium, and uh, many countries at that time became independent. And, but their colonial bosses had not prepared them for independence. And really, there were no graduates. There was, there was one university graduate, Congolese, at the time of independence. Uh, and he was a Roman Catholic who'd been through their seminary and gone into the priesthood. But there was none others. Uh, there were no soldiers other than the armies in the, so in the, in the army. There, there were no bosses, black-skinned, dark-skinned. And um, chaos broke. I mean, there was just the, 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 the European, pale-skinned as we were called, mm -hmm. left. Uh, sadly, a lot of missionaries as well, because over the radios we heard that um, the African army had gone on the rampage and they'd gone into a mission station and raped one of the missionaries and fear took hold of the community. Uh, and uh, most of the pale skinned people fled, got out of the country. And we had four years of really frightening um, anarchy, shops emptied, there was no food, there was nothing, uh, there were no medicines. And uh, it was very difficult. You worked with what you got left to work with and until that, that ran out too. But um, and then in 1964, September, we, as far as I'm concerned, with no warning, we suddenly found ourselves it, at war. Uh, to be truthful, when I first, the, the, Saturday afternoon, early August, actually, early August, uh, the, a truckload of these wicked servant, uh, wicked soldiers drove into my village with a wounded man, uh, and they said it was a wounded civilian. The word they used in Swahili, was a word you would only use if you were at war, which we didn't know we were at war. And that you were was so the cut off from world totally news cut off from everything. And um, that was the beginning of five months of really horrific. Uh, initially, they didn't touch us; uh, they told us to keep out of things. But what we watched between dark skin and dark skin was terrible, terrible. And then, uh, ultimately, twenty-seven missionaries were murdered. 27 of our Protestant missionaries were murdered, over 200 uh, pale-skinned nuns were murdered, mm. and countless priests, the, the, the murder figures were... But at the same time, a quarter of a million Africans lost their lives. Mm. We, we tended to harbour on what we pale-skins got, but really, the, our African brothers, and any of our Africans who had loved us and cared for us and looked after us, uh, when we were eventually rescued, they turned on them, and uh, it, it, was, it was very horrific. And uh, halfway through, after about 10 weeks, they actually came to my house one night. And um, I don't 
know what time. By then they'd taken our watches and clocks and everything else that was takeable. <laughs> mm. uh, and uh, it was a horrific night. I was, uh, they came into the house and said they were looking for whatever. Uh, and they smashed everything. They ransacked the house and they didn't find what they were looking for. I didn't happen to possess a radio or anything like this. But um, then they turned on me and it was a, uh, there was a moment, I was out on the veranda of the house at one moment, and this little, I don't know what, sergeant major of the rebel soldiers stood there with a gun pointed, a pistol pressed against my forehead. Uh, and I don't know if it was loaded or not, but I presumed it was. Uh, and he said, say that Lumumba, and that was their patron saint, say that Lumumba is the savior of the world. You know, I wasn't praying, I wasn't thinking, but I just knew that wasn't true. <laughs> I knew the only one saviour of the world, and that was Jesus. So I just said, no, never. Jesus is the only saviour of the world. I, I think in my heart, I think I was actually praying he would shoot. It would have been quick, clean, finished. But, but uh, out, on the, out on the courtyard was one of my junior students from the college, uh, and uh, he was being held by these men, and he broke loose, and he threw himself between me and this little soldier. He said, you don't touch her but over my dead body. And they turned on him and they beat him up so savagely. Uh, I didn't know till well, two years later that he was not killed actually, he survived, but it was mm -hmm. terrible, terrible. Then they drove me down the corridor of my home. And somehow in that moment, I, I think I was saying, God, where are you? What, whatever's going on? And there was suddenly a tremendous, what can I say, consciousness. God was there, it was big. Uh, and uh, he was There was a moment where you thought you'd been abandoned. Well, I, I don't think I ever lost my faith in God, but I just felt he wasn't looking after me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and suddenly I knew he was, and he was in charge, and that these rebel soldiers were very small compared to the almightiness of God. Uh, and uh, as they drove me down the corridor, I think he spoke to me, but I didn't hear words. It was after looking back, I had to ask the Lord, what do you actually say? put into words for me. I think what he said was, can you thank me? And my heart was saying, no, this has gone too far. I, I knew what lay ahead. I could see the whole thing was horrible. Uh, and he said, can you thank me for trusting you? I, I thought, this is unbelievable. I, I know I trust him, but I never thought of him trusting me. Mm. It was revolutionary to think that he trusted me. I, and in this second, I could see what he was saying. I thought I could trust you. I thought you wouldn't bite me. <laughs> and God was saying, can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? And I, even in the midst of the darkness, it was, I'd only split minute, all this, uh, it was, dear Lord, I don't know what you're saying, I don't know why you're saying it, I don't know who will ever be blessed by this, but if this is part of your plan, yes, thank you for trusting me. And immediately uh, I was flooded with a sense of the enormous peace peace of God. It was wonderful. I just knew, it, it was as though he said, all I want of you is the loan of your body. Uh, and it was Jesus in me. They weren't fighting me, they were fighting Jesus. Uh, and all I had to do was say, yes, Jesus, I'm yours. You're in me, you, 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 just as you want. And uh, it didn't stop the pain, the humiliation, the cruelty. Uh, it didn't take that away. It was all there. But suddenly it was with him and for him. And it just revolutionized everything. It was wonderful. Later, years later, when, when we came home on furlough, uh, we were rescued by mercenary soldiers. We were sent home. And I talked to all, of, all over the United Kingdom. And some, every now and again, a woman would come up to me at the end of women's meetings and say, but why did God allow? And then they'd just pause. They'd say, why did a God of love allow suffering, really they were saying to me, why did God of love allow you to suffer? You were a missionary, you were out there serving him. I thought, you know, we never asked that question. So I didn't have an answer because uh, we never asked the question. And I just thought, Lord, you're just so wonderful and you're so marvelous and it's such a privilege that he is our master, our friend, our savior, our Lord, our king, uh, that, that, that he's the right to anything. And I'd, I'd given my life to him, so why not? Well, that's one of your teachings, living sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1, submit your body, a living sacrifice. Yes. God was calling this in, in a way you never would have anticipated. In that night, prior to your teeth being kicked out at, by a rebel boot, prior to being brutally raped twice, 
were you aware that he wasn't abandoning you? He was there, and he was going to do something yes. in this, through this yes. darkest, most evil experience that you couldn't at that moment see. It really is though he wrote one word, I could, I could almost read it in the sky, privilege. That, the, that, the, that right from the night I was converted, the, 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 the leader of the conference where I was gave me a Bible. I'd never owned a Bible before. And he wrote in my Bible, Philippians 3.10, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the privilege of the fellowship of his sufferings. I'd been a Christian about half an hour and he was saying to me it would be a privilege to suffer for Jesus. And right from that day, the word privilege has really underlined everything in my Christian life. And it was privilege. He, he asked me for something. He said, I want the loan of your body. Uh, it was amazing. Almighty God, the great creator, heavenly father. Uh, and uh, it was something I had to respond to. And it was privilege. And I think it's this word privilege which has made such a difference. It's just because it, it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to serve him or to suffer. Uh, and the suffering's so tiny. To get it in perspective, for me, five months, uh, and I've lived 85 years. What's five months? It's terribly small. Now, I've read books of other people, uh, uh, Pastor Wormbrandt, who went to was nine years, I think, of uh, prison. In prison by, by himself uh, mm -hmm. uh, and terrible tortures. And uh, I've heard of Pastor, I can't remember his name now, in China terrible imprisonment and the wicked, wicked things they did to him. Uh, mine was very, very small. How long was the healing emotionally, spiritually out of this terrible abuse? When I got home, it was as though one woke up from a nightmare and I didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to. I wanted to die. I wanted to go to be with Jesus. And it really took three months. I got home on New Year's Day and in late March, early April, I don't remember now, I went with my mother for Easter to our uh, cottage home in, in, in um, UK. And it was there at Palm Sunday service that the Lord eventually got through to me to stop being a fool. Uh, <laughs> it was me, I wasn't wanting to go on living. You see, quite a lot of our people were murdered. And other people said, there, there was a lovely uh, American boy uh, and he was murdered. And people said, his mother prayed for him your mother prayed for you. Why did God answer her prayers and not his prayers? I thought, that's ridiculous. We thought he'd got the best part. He'd gone to be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was still down here suffering. <laughs> when I first heard this story over 30 years ago, you peppered this testimony with a, the most warm mm -hmm. phrase, wonderful Jesus, wonderful Jesus. Yes. I'll never forget it. Our viewers don't know yet all the reasons why this was wonderful, truly wondrous. And that's why we have to have you back tomorrow. The tragic irony, at least at the outset, is that you were heading out there as an, as an enthusiastic Christian and doctor. Give me this mountain. That was your prayer. You wanted to live on the mountain tops with God. Yeah. If, if you could have gone from one mountain of transfiguration to another, your prayer would have been answered. Did you not feel betrayed in your trust and in your hopes and dreams as these events unfolded? No, I don't think we ever thought like that. Um, I suppose there was, a, there was a moment of, you, 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 I was very conscious of being alone as far as being a pale skin was concerned that night. Uh, and uh, yes, I suppose there was a momentary thought of saying, why God? But immediately he spoke into the situation and he said, don't ask why. Um, that I, I think I grew up with the phrase, is it worth it? Everything, everything in life had to be worth it. If uh, dad said to me as a child, uh, you don't touch the kitchen knife. And I'd look at the kitchen knife and I think, why not? <laughs> and then I think, uh -uh. dad said, don't. And I knew my father, <laughs> so it wasn't worth trying it out. So everything was, is, is it worth it, is it worth it? And I think when the, the awful m moments came in the rebellion and, and the sense, is it really worth this? And you almost felt, no, this has gone too far. I can't, I can't accept it. It seemed that the price was too high to pay. 
And, and then God seemed to say, change the question. He, he has to keep on saying this to me. Quite recently he said it again. It's not, is it worth it? It's, am I worthy? Mm. Is he worthy? It almost sounds like saying, is it worth it? Is he worthy? Mm. And it, it just turns the whole thing round. Instead of looking at the price I think I have to pay, he's thinking of the privilege he wants to give. And always the answer is yes, he is worthy. The fact that Almighty God is willing to apparently use us in any small ways. Uh, and he's been so good to me in the, I mean, that's 1964, which is what I can't add, 45 years ago. Oh. Uh, and in those 45 years, he's shown so often in little ways, in bigger ways, people I've been able to encourage and help to realize that rape, why are we women, we feel rape's the last word of horror. Uh, and we, we don't want to talk about it, we don't think about it, we certainly don't speak about it in public or on the television screen. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet, why? It, it's only, it's external, you're sinned against, it's not your sin, it can't touch your spirit, it's only your body. Uh, and uh, suddenly to realize, that, that's true, that's true. But it can't get into my mind or soul, I, I'm me. And um, I've been able to help so many girls to look at things like that. Uh, and to, to pray together with them and say, I've used this phrase, can you thank me for trusting you? I, the girl after girl, I said, can you thank? There was a lovely lady in, in, um, in Australia. Uh, her her two-year-old son had been drowned in a family swimming pool. Mm. Uh, and she said, Christian, so-called friends, had said to her, praise the Lord. And I was angry. I thought, how could you say that to a little lady who's lost her son? Uh, uh, and, and then she said, they said, if I can't praise the Lord, then I must have sinned in my heart. By then I was so angry, I thought, this is not the way God would speak to a dear mother. And I, I said to God, God, tell me right now, what do I say to this woman? And all that came into my mind was the memory of this dreadful night in Congo. I thought, what's that got to do with it, Lord? Nothing to do with it at all. And then he gave me these words, can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? And although the whole thing was a totally different situation, I shared this with this lady, her name was Valerie, and, I told, and little by little she came through and we knelt together we were in a big marquee tent and she thanked God for trusting her, even if he never told her why. I met her three or four years later. I was back in Australia taking meetings and she came up to me on a Sunday night in a Baptist church. She says, you don't remember me, do you? I said, I do, Val, I've prayed for you every day for since I last met you. Yeah. Well, she said, uh, uh, she shared with her husband what I'd said to her, and he couldn't take it. And yet, a few months later, a child in the a house down the same road they lived in ran out of the house and was killed by a passing car. Mm -hmm. The parents were not Christians, in fact, they were of another faith. And she said, we went and comforted the parents. And because they saw how we had taken the death of our son, they allowed us to come for them, and over these four years, we've had the joy of leading first one and then the other to put their trust in the Lord Jesus mm. Christ. And now we know why God took our son home. And these sort of ways, I can look back and say, now I know. We, he doesn't have to tell us why. Sometimes probably doesn't tell us why. And yet, Helen, Dr. Helen, God so powerfully allowed you to see in the horror in yes. 1964, yes. not just why, but to reveal to you that what was happening was an answer to your own prayers That's right. for these people that you had served and longed to reach with the gospel for 12 years to a barrier. Yes. How did God use your suffering to turn that around? Uh, You'll have to tell the story. Yes, I'll have to tell the story. Well, we were taken away and put in a prison. And uh, one day they came to me in the prison and everybody else around was protecting me because I had in many ways suffered more than many of them. But I heard them asking, we were in a convent, they were asking the Mother Superior where was, nobody knew my English name. They all called me Mama Luca. Mama Luca. Who was the doctor of the area. Uh, and they said, oh, they didn't have a Mama Luca. They only had my English name on the list. But anyway, they were saying that a Greek woman uh, who was expecting a baby was in great pain and they needed the doctor's help. So I went and I went with them and I went down and we went downtown and I got a rebel soldier on either side of me with guns. And uh, You were in pretty rough shape. 
I I'm pretty rough shape myself. <laughs> and they took me down to this home where, I don't know, there were possibly as many as 80 Greek Cypriots who were the uh, commercial workers of the area. And they were there with their wives and their children, thrown into this house, taken captive by these rebels. And they, they all knew me. I'd been their doctor for 12 years. And there was no other doctor in the area but me. Uh, and, uh, but it was as though nobody knew me. Their eyes were down, they were de deep distress. And nobody looked up and I had to walk through them, climb over them into a room at the back where there was this little lady lying on a bed, obviously in pain. She was about seven months pregnant. And I was saying, God, what do you want me to do? I got rebel soldiers either side of me, uh, and God seemed to tell me what to do. Now, I, I could speak English and French and Swahili and a little bit of Lingala, but I couldn't speak Greek. So we had five languages there between us, and the rebels only knew two of them. So I would examine the woman and say in Swahili, does it hurt here? Then I'd repeat it in Bengala, does it hurt here? Then I'd say it in French, does it hurt here? And then I'd say in English to the Greeks, would you translate it into Greek, please? Uh, and the rebel soldiers presumed I was saying the same thing again, mm -hmm. uh, all the way down the line. And medical I, talk. It, medical talk. I talked to her, and after a bit, I said, well, I'm going to give you some meds. I'm going to give you some meds. I'm going to give you some meds. And I'm going to pray with you. Would you pray the prayer after me in your own language? And I, I just gave them the gospel. And you I talked prayed to them about them, Jesus. Talked to them about Jesus and said how Jesus had died for them and all they had to do, and I prayed a prayer, children's prayer of acceptance, and I heard all around the room the muttered, Amen, Amen. They were with me, they were following me in their distress. When I eventually left the house, they were all looking up and smiling and they wanted to shake my hands. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. And, God, you are marvellous. You were like, they've, all these years I've preached them, they've never wanted to listen, but now because they know I suffered worse than they did, so they're willing to listen. They were open. And your life, this whole chapter, uh, what, what absolutely blew me away as the initially shattered, cr fresh Christian thinking, this isn't supposed to happen to someone <laughs> who's put their trust in the Lord Jesus and is serving him with all she has, but to see that you actually were a type of Christ. You, through yes. this journey, you even had the mock trial. Tell our viewers about that. <laughs> yes, they, they, they'd rounded us up. We were living in another place at that time under house arrest. They'd rounded us up, they'd beaten us, they'd driven us barefoot along rough gravel roads, and it was awful. Uh, and they'd taken us to this place, and we were driven into, put into one room, about eight women and two men, all of us Protestant missionaries. And then they called me out alone. These were the old moments we dreaded. And the little rebel soldier made me sit down on a chair in the room he was sitting in. Uh, and um, at that moment, a truck drove in. It was about, it was sometime, let's say, nine o'clock at night, I don't remember. A truck drove in with yelling, yelling soldiers on it. And a small, uniformed soldier came into the room, probably some lieutenant of the rebel army. And um, he be was talking rapidly to the little leader of the group I was with. And then he turned and looked at me and he said, and he used my African name, aren't you Mama Luca? Aren't you the doctor from Nebobongo? Well, I didn't say yes, it didn't pay to be Mama Luca in those days. So he's, uh, the other soldier said, yes, she is. And he turned around and said, don't you touch her. She's good. When I was wounded at the beginning of this war, I went to her hospital and he had come to me and he had a bullet wound and it had just gone along and out here in two little wounds and we'd put a bit of a band-aid on both and gave him a cup of coffee <laughs> and God healed him. And he showed this, he undid his shirt and there were the two bullet wounds. Uh, and he said, she's good, don't tell. And, and he turned, took me by the hand, took me out, put me with the other missionaries. And the, it was amazing because, yeah, I suppose I left out the bit in the middle. The, the leader of the rebels had said to me, um, you're going to be my wife. And if you mm. agree to be my wife, I promise you the other women will not be touched. And in a sense, he was giving me the ability to preserve them from rape and wickedness and cruelty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a choice you can't make. You, you, you can't say yes or no to either side. I, I would never want to become his wife. But, but uh, Tell us about standing in front of 800 men who'd already been primed to call out, she's a liar. They took me away and, 
Uh, I'd been very badly beaten up and my glasses were broken and I couldn't see without them and my face had been all beaten up and I was in a bad state. And they drove me away and I, I could just about see light coming in. I couldn't see anything else. And it was just as daylight was breaking, we came into a clearing of a, f a forest village. They beat the talking drums and these men came out from all around. Nobody dared not to in those days. The rebel soldiers were the only people with guns uh, and you did as you were told. And there were about 800 of them filling this courtyard. And uh, I was to be tried by the, um, I don't know, lieutenant of the group. Uh, and uh, he asked me something that had happened the week before by this other rebel soldier who had raped me. Uh, and I wasn't going to speak up in loud in front of all these men, so I sort of dropped my voice. So he slugged me with a gun across my face and I couldn't stand the pain, so I spoke up. Uh, and uh, we had this mock trial and they'd all been told that at a certain given sign, they would say, she's a liar, she's a liar. And what do we do with her? And they had a word, we never did understand what it really meant, mateko, mateko but it meant crucify her. Really? And you, you knew you would die, you didn't know how, and there came the moment in the trial scene when they must have been given the sign, and suddenly, these 800 men, suddenly, instead of seeing me as the hated white foreigner, they saw me as their doctor, and they rushed forward, they pushed the rebel soldiers out of the way, and they took me in their arms, uh, and in that wonderful moment, the, the, the black-white barrier had gone, uh, and they said, she's ours. They used a word in Kibbutu, which really meant uh, she's blood of our blood and bone of our bone. Uh, and uh, the, the rift between dark skin and pale skin was driven away and we were reunited as one. And God was so good. He used so many things that, that uh, he was working out his own wonderful purposes. Many, many came to the Lord through those days of suffering. Uh, and uh, God Because you said yes to God. Yes, Can I, I guess use your right. body? <laughs> That's right. Yes. The walls of division were broken down. Yes. And the kingdom was expanded. This is before you ever got to reach people who are struggling and stumbling and broken all over That's the globe. Right. Another one of my favorite parts of this story. <laughs> Your director, field director, regularly sent you books. And one of the books you were encouraged to read you sent back, you did not want to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. <laughs> and what did you say to that field director? Well, I really, I sent the book back very politely. You didn't do anything else with our field director. Uh, I said, I can't read this. I said, if God ever asks me to be burned at the stake, uh, I'll say yes, but I won't be singing. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it, it, I just couldn't take it all. And then very shortly after that... Three months later. That's right, we were taken away and we were stood before a firing squad and we were singing every song, chorus, hymn we could think of with the name of Jesus. We were singing in English, French, Swahili, anything. So the last word that these rebel soldiers would hear before they shot us was the name of Jesus. Now you weren't singing to impress your captors. <laughs> Something else was very real in that moment when you thought you were about to die. Yes. And that was the presence of Jesus. Jesus was there. He, he was so wonderfully there and it was, it was privileged. It was just this wonderful certain knowledge I was going to go to be with Jesus. And really at that minute, nothing else counted. And uh, he is wonderful. <laughs> Just for the last minute, we have to set the record straight because this is a story that has gone viral and I have confirmed it is your chapter. The crate with the hot water bottle <laughs> and the doll. Can you quickly recap that story? Well, it's just... I've been called out in the middle of the night to the maternity half part of our hospital and a woman giving birth to her second child, but sadly I thank God this rarely happened, but we lost the mother. The mother died and we delivered this tiny premature baby. And um, I sent the midwives off to, to get the little cots we put these tiny babies into and uh, cotton wool to wrap them in and oil. And so another midwife went out to fill a hot water bottle to put beside the boat baby. And she came back into the room and said, I'm awfully sorry, doctor. I took the hot water bottle, I boiled the kettle, and as I filled the bottle, burst hot water bottle and said, it is our last. I said, okay, you put the baby as near to the fire as you can. You've got to keep the baby warm. If the baby gets cold, it will die, etc., etc. 
and next day at midday I went to have prayers with our orphanage children, as I did every day, and any of the children wanted to gather around me for prayer time, and I'd give them different things to pray about. And this particular day I told the children of this tiny baby and asked them to pray for the nurses that they would stay awake all night to keep that baby warm. If the baby got cold, it would die. I mentioned that the baby had a two-year-old sister who was crying because her mummy had died. I mentioned the burst hot water bottle. During prayer time, different children prayed for different things. And then one little 10-year-old girl, Ruth, she prayed in the usual blunt way of our African children. Please, God, send us a hot water bottle. Now, God, it'll be no good tomorrow. Send it this afternoon. If it comes tomorrow, the baby will be dead. <laughs> I, I'm sort of swallowing hard. I said, while you're about it, God, would you send a dolly for the little two-year-old sister so that she'll know that Jesus really loves her? And that afternoon, the parcel came. It was the first parcel I ever... I'd been out there four years. I'd never had a parcel from home. Uh, and despite the fact that I live on the equator, somebody packing that parcel had been prompted by God to put in a hot water bottle. And a child from my Bible class at home had put in a dolly for a little girl. And uh, it came that afternoon in answer to a 10-year-old child's prayer. And the amazing thing was, you know, that parcel had been on the way five months to get to us. It had left England oh, in July, before you reached call, us in December. That's absolutely it. Lord. And it came that afternoon because a child prayed. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's lovely. That, that's that's my, my version of the hot water bottle and the dolly story. <laughs> and it is Helen's story. You will run into it again. And you may want to, to know more of these stories of Helen's life on the field. The most traumatic story has been a game changer, a life changer, a theology changer for millions of people. I'm going to show you the book that is now, it's actually WEC, your mission has yes. put it together, which is wonderful. Give me this mountain. Yes. And of course, the second part of that story is he gave a, a valley, valley, a valley. And then all the teaching books, living sacrifice, living faith, living holiness, living fellowship. I hope this is not your last trip to Canada. And before I let you go, Helen, would you just say the question into which camera? This one, one more time. The question that has shattered and reformed our thinking. Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? Uh, and he doesn't have to tell us why, but he often does in his gracious, loving mercy. God is working on a canvas way, f way too big for us to see from this vantage point. Calls for trust, and I hope you've been encouraged today. Dr. Rosevere, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.